To recount the past, Alien and Aliens were excellent films. Both had gone through years of struggle to achieve greatness. Dan O'Bannon, Ronald Chusette, Ridley Scott and James Cameron fought tooth and nail to have their visions realised on the silver screen. However, compared to the development of Alien 3, the struggles of Alien and Aliens look like a walk in the park. Thank you, gentlemen. This is rumour control. Here are the facts. 20th Century Fox was incredibly interested in a sequel to Aliens. The Alien franchise had rewarded Fox not with one, but now two critical, academic and financial successes, and they wanted more. Without delay, executives at Fox approached David Geiler, Walter Hill and Gordon Carroll at Brandywine Productions to discuss the development of further sequels. Geiler didn't match Fox's enthusiasm, stating they were hesitant on a third film. Well, Alien 3, everybody wanted to make the sequel to Alien, kind of except us. We weren't so, uh, I mean, we were happy to do it, but we weren't all that enthused. Because we thought, you know, what do you do with this one to make it different? You know, the whole idea of you can't do something that's just going to be a reheat of one or two. Fox, however, was adamant. So the trio at Brandywine began brainstorming. Becoming inspired by the Cold War tensions between the US and the Soviet Union, while also wanting to explore the deceitful nature of the Weyland Yutani Corporation, they eventually settled on a story treatment that would be split into two films. The trio approached author William Gibson to write the script for the third film. Considered to be the father of the cyberpunk genre, and already a huge fan of Alien, Gibson accepted the offer. Gibson's script picked up right after the conclusion of Aliens. The Sulaco would drift into space owned by the Union of Progressive Peoples, a breakaway communist society fighting against the capitalist Earth. The ship would eventually then reach the space station slash shopping mall called Anchor Point. The protagonist of the franchise switches from Ripley to Hicks, with Ripley in a coma for most of the film. The script heavily leaned into the action, with Anchor Point revealed to be a breeding ground for Raylan Yutani's Xenomorph Army. Gibson's film culminated in the UPP, or the Soviets, and Hicks banding together to face a common enemy, taking the fight to the Xenomorphs in the planned fourth instalment. Upon submission, Gibson's script was not well received by Brandywine or Fox. Ultimately, their suggested changes caused Gibson to leave the project. While Gibson's film will never see the light of day, his script has since been adapted into a comic series and a novel. With Gibson off the project, Eric Red was brought on to write the screenplay. This script took a severe departure from the previous two films, completely neglecting Ripley to instead focus on a new set of characters aboard a biodome in space. The biodome is established as a settlement reminiscent of small town USA, with wheat fields and farms. Beneath the town was a high-tech research facility where the military secretly bred and studied xenomorphs. The xenomorphs escape and cause havoc to the town. The story ends and I must stress that this is real, with the station turning into a giant biomechanical xenomorph creature. Go, go, Power this script, rather unsurprisingly, was also not well received by Gyla or Fox, with Red being fired and the idea for developing two sequels scrapped simultaneously. Red himself disowns the script, stating that it is the one script I completely disowned because it was not my script. It was the rushed product of too many story conferences and interference with no time to write and turned out utter crap. Ominous foreshadowing for the events to come. With the two writers down, David Tui was the next in line to write the script for Alien 3. Tui has become a prolific writer and director, having worked on Waterworld, Pitch Black and The Fugitive. At this point, two years had passed since Fox first met with Brandywine to discuss Alien 3. Like Red's script, Tui's version completely disregarded Ripley, with the story taking place on a prison space station orbiting Earth. The prison, unsurprisingly, is also being used by Welland Yutani to breed and run illegal experiments on the Xenomorphs. An accident frees the Xenomorphs, forcing the surviving prisoners and staff to team up and escape. Fox did not enjoy this version either, with Fox President Joe Roth stating that Ripley was the centerpiece of the series and had to be included. Weaver was then approached to return eventually agreeing with a reported $4 million salary, plus a share of the box office receipts, and the request that the story is suitably impressive and non-reliant on guns. As Tui was rewriting the script to include Ripley, 
Fox hired New Zealand film director Vincent Ward to direct the film. Ward had just come off his second feature film, a fantasy adventure titled The Navigator, a medieval odyssey. Guyla saw potential in Ward and approached him to direct. I got the call to come to LA, got the offer to direct Alien 3. I told them I wasn't interested in sequels. They were, by the third phone call, I thought, well, I might as well give it a shot. I looked at the script they'd sent me. I didn't like it. I thought it was just the standard sci-fi stuff that you expect, all the gadgetry and so on. But I had a tiny idea, and on the plane over, I, in my imagination, I expanded it into a story. So by the time I got to LA, I sat in, I sat in with the head of the studio, I sat in with my studio executive, um, and with the producers, and I pitched this story to them. And really to my surprise, because I just wanted to get out of Australia for a break, they really liked it. Even though Tui was developing his script, Fox gave Ward the green light to build his idea. Fox even lied to Tui, telling him that Ward's idea was for the fourth movie, not the third. When Tui eventually learned of Fox's duplicity, he quit and left the project. Ward's concept for Alien 3 is the most well-known of these unmade screenplays. Infamously labelled by former London Times journalist David Hughes as the greatest sci-fi film never made. The story by Ward was set on a monastery space station. The space station was incredibly anachronistic in design, constructed mainly from wood. The station serves as a refuge for the all-male monks, who have rejected modern technology and embraced religion and celibacy. The concept designs are incredible. It's truly something that was never seen before. The story focused solely on Ripley, with Hicks, Newt and Bishop completely absent. The story focuses on Ripley's soul searching, complicated by the impending birth of the alien within her, eventually deciding to sacrifice herself to kill the alien. Ward's film progressed so far that several sets were designed at Pinewood Studios. However, even though Ward was promised complete creative control of the project, Fox began to demand changes to the film. Even though I'd had a commitment from everybody that they loved this idea, the idea that I'd had, by the time I you know, was heading over to England and beginning getting close to you know, hiring crew and so on, they said, well, we like two out of three of your ideas. And I went, yeah, well, we like the bit where, the alien, where you're going to scare the bejesus out of people and you're going to have, a, have an alien in Sigourney. The bit about the world, well, got this kind of list of saying we want the following changes. Meet tomorrow with one of the key senior executives at Fox. I was made to wait outside a door for an hour like a school kid and I was in a terrible mood, I have to say, by the time I'd waited for an hour. And I'd seen this list which was very aggressive. It was you do, you obey. So I tried to talk my way around it and was completely unsuccessful. It was told, do it or be fired. First I said, you know what, I'd rather be fired. Fox executives got nervous that the concept was too out there for it to become a financial success. Ward's baby was being manhandled. As a result, Ward left the production. So, to quickly recap, at this point in time, 1990, the film had no director, no script, sets built by production designer Norman Reynolds that were no longer usable, and the release date of Christmas 1991 that Fox refused to change. Essentially, they were back to square one, now with the addition of a doomsday clock. For the director, Fox approached a talented young filmmaker, David Fincher. Hill and Guyler had discovered Ridley Scott and James Cameron when they were virtual unknowns, so they were well disposed to hiring beginners. This was to be Fincher's debut feature film, although he had previous experience in the industry. Fincher began working on music videos, directing videos for artists such as George Michael, Michael Jackson and Madonna. Pregnant mothers, please, don't smoke. Incredibly impressed by his resume, Fox hired Fincher to direct Alien 3. It is also rumoured that Fox believed that since this was Fincher's first feature film, he would be easy to undermine and control. Weaver demanded that David Guyler and Walter Hill write the screenplay, as they were the only ones in her eyes who could write Ripley. In her own words, the others made her sound like a pissed off gym teacher. With time ticking down, Guyler and Hill decided to take elements from Ward's script and combine them with Tui's prison set screenplay. By the time the film was released, Fox had spent $13 million on the writing of the film, with more than 10 different writers contributing to the project. Stan Winston was approached to reprise his role as the visual effects lead, but was unable due to scheduling conflicts. 
he instead recommended Tom Woodruff Jr. and Alec Gillis. This effects team relied on a mixture of digital compositing, visual effects, and a rod puppet, with mixed results, but I'll get into more of that later. Alien 3 entered into production in Pinewood Studios on January 14th, 1991. Even though the script had not been finished, and continued to undergo significant revisions even as filming was taking place. We went through this production continually reworking the script to make up for a short pre-production, a rush into... The movie got greenlit based on a whole different version of the script. And David was forced to deal with that in a very short period of time where he had to design the alien, he had to design the sets, and he had to write the script all the way into the depths of production. As you can imagine, filming was incredibly fraught. Fincher frequently clashed with 20th Century Fox over the direction of the film. Fincher's ideas were constantly vetoed by the executives, who, at this point, only wanted the film to release on time and under budget. Fincher was frequently shadowed by Fox on set, ensuring that the studio's demands were enforced. Fox's initial assumption that they could bring Fincher to heel was proving difficult. Fincher was a renowned perfectionist, often delaying shooting so that the shot can be just right. With a perfectionist director and a frantic studio, tensions became hostile. It's amazing to me that Fox is the number one studio in the country because they're all such a bunch of morons. It was a baptism by fire. I was very naive. I'd always had this naive idea that everybody wants to make movies as good as they can be, which is stupid. I'd always thought, well, surely you don't want to have the 20th century logo over a shitty movie, and they were like, well, as long as it opens. Additionally, Fincher was forced to deal with a script that changed day to day. Scenes would be filmed one day, only for the crew to realise that those scenes had been dropped from the film entirely the next day. It became common for the script to be tweaked so that expensive sets could be reused in filming. Fincher and the crew ended up working 18 hour days and 6 day weeks, in a desperate attempt to try and meet the stop date. To no one's surprise, the general consensus from the cast and crew was that the production was confused, chaotic, poorly managed and hostile. Eventually, the situation reached a boiling point. 23 days over schedule and millions over budget, Fox pulled the plug. Fincher and editor Terry Wallings assembled a rough cut of the existing footage and presented it to Fox. Unimpressed by what they saw, Fox demanded a series of reshoots. The film's release date was also pushed back to May 1992. It's unclear when, but at some point during the exhausting reshoots in LA, Fincher left the project. What was ironic was that Fox chose David Fincher, who was so talented, and from the second he got the job they undermined him by not giving him what he wanted. For me, it was a real education in how not to make a movie. With Fincher gone, the film's completion was left entirely to the studio who butchered the film's runtime down to increase the number of daily screenings. The film's ending scene caused a heated debate internally, causing the scene to still be edited just three weeks before its release in the US. Finally, after years of rewrites and reshoots, Alien 3 released on May 22nd, 1992. Where are the others? They didn't make it. What? They didn't survive. If there was one word that summarised Alien 3, it would be nihilistic. The film rejects the warmth and compassion established by James Cameron at the end of Aliens, instead returning the franchise to its existentialist roots. Everything Ripley fought for has been completely stripped from her, dumping her onto a barren wasteland turned prison colony filled with the dregs of humanity. This concept wouldn't be so bad if the film didn't suffer from the classic idiom of too many cooks in the kitchen. As stated in my previous section, the development of Alien 3 was rough, to say the least, with years of confusing, tiring work resulting in an end product that is… fine? Having now watched both the theatrical and assembly cut, I can say that while the film's mixed reception is warranted, there are some interesting aspects of the film that I found very enjoyable, even if those aspects are scattered throughout a messy and scatterbrained film. Before diving in, I will do things differently for this film analysis. In my previous videos on the Alien series, I've kept my comparison of the different cuts of each film separate from my analysis of the film itself. However, unlike Alien and Aliens, where the changes between each cut are minimal and simply provide additions to two already great films, here, the difference between the theatrical and the assembly cut is night and day. For the release of the Alien Quadrilogy set in 2003, the directors of the Alien series were invited to create alternative versions of their films. Fincher rejected the invitation, hence it being called the assembly cut and not the director's cut. Whole sequences are reworked, 
some footage from the theatrical is removed, an entire new subplot is introduced, characters die at different points and under different circumstances, and the alien's host is an entirely different animal. While the assembly cut is as close to Finch's vision as the film will ever reach, it's not Finch's cut. That cut of the film just doesn't exist, due to how severe he was treated during production. With that in mind, combining the cut comparison with the film analysis will be more compelling. That way, I'll illustrate just how improved the assembly cut is over the theatrical. But, without further ado, let's begin with the theatrical. Similar to the previous films, Alien 3 begins with an opening title sequence that establishes the film's tone. Elliot Goldenthal, the film's composer, creates an eerie atmosphere through a chilling choir composition while maintaining the alien theme. Interspersed between the opening credits is the film's inciting incident. While Ripley, Newt, Hicks and Bishop remain in choir sleep on the Sulaco, a xenomorph egg is on board. Birthed from the egg, the facehugger attacks the pods, managing to attach itself to one of the crew. This causes a fire in the ship, forcing the vessel to jettison the crew out of the Sulaco in an EV. They crash land on Fire Arena 161, a planet housing an all-male correctional facility. We're barely four minutes in, and already the film creates one glaring question. For this film to work, Fincher tries to force the audience into believing that an egg somehow managed to get its way onto the Sulaco even though there is no reasonable point in the ending of Aliens where this could have happened. Let's dissect this. Firstly, based on the conclusion of Aliens, while chasing Ripley and Newt through an exploding facility, the Queen would have had to have been carrying an egg using her arms, which we never see. But even with that leap of logic, the audience then has to believe that once the Queen attaches herself to the dropship and makes her way onto the Sulaco, she then would have had to have quietly detached herself from the dropship sneak around the Sulaco, place the egg in a place no one could find it, then sneak back onto the dropship and attack Bishop. Remember that the Queen is 4.5 metres tall and weighs 10 tonnes. Contrived is an understatement. This immediately places Alien 3 on shaky foundations. The issues with the film's introduction continues once the EEV crash lands on the planet. Opening up the EEV are three prisoners who investigate the absolute mess inside. This introduction to the prisoners feels incredibly sloppy and confusing. Not only can we barely see two of the men through the smoke and the dangling wiring, but none of these prisoners are in the main cast. We can also barely hear them due to the overtop wind sound effects blurring while these characters try to talk. How many? Don't know. Three, maybe four. Hey, Frank, can we hurry this up? The only detail of significance we learn from these prisoners in this scene is that one of them owns a dog. The prisoners discover that Ripley is alive and bring her into the prison's med bay. While Ripley is being healed, Fincher reinforces the demise of Hicks, Newt and Bishop through a pretty traumatic report overlaid under shots of their dead, dismembered bodies. The scene is incredibly gratuitous and establishes, for better or worse, the bleak world Ripley has fallen into. Now, this decision to kill off Ripley's surrogate family was met with a vitriolic response from the fans. And it's easy to sympathise with them. Aliens does such a fantastic job of building this family of traumatised people that it comes as a shock to the system when they immediately die in the next film's opening five minutes. James Cameron himself was openly against this decision. I thought the decision to eliminate Newt, Hicks and Bishop was dumb. I thought it was a huge slap in the face to the fans. While I share the frustration with the fans, when considering what Alien 3 is as a film, I'm okay with the idea of the characters being killed off. In a perfect world, I would love to see an Alien 3 with Ripley and her surrogate family taking the fight to the Xenomorphs, but we're sadly not in that world. In a setting where most of the characters are crazed convicted felons who have committed murder, assault and rape, I'm perfectly fine with not having a 12 year old girl running around in that kind of setting. Back at the EEV, the dog, Spike, shown previously of the inmates is now on its own, barking at a surviving facehugger inside the ship. This is one of the few chilling shots in the entire film. It's ominous and menacing. We then meet most of the inmates, Warden Andrews and prison guard Aaron, in a meeting. During the meeting, Warden Andrews reveals to the inmates that the sole survivor of the crash is a woman, causing a stir. I just want to say that I've taken a vow of celibacy. It also includes women. With this information, Warden Andrews instructs prison doctor Clemens, played by Charles Dance, that Ripley will stay in the infirmary until Wayland Yutani's rescue team arrives. Now that we're a few scenes into the theatrical cut, let's start looking into the assembly cut and how that version opens. 
Both versions begin identically, with the events on the Sulaco interspersed with the film's opening credits. I didn't state this in my theatrical analysis, but besides the opening's insane leap of logic, it is creepy and demonstrates Finch's filmmaking ability. The sequence induces more fear and terror than the rest of the film. I particularly love this shot of the face hugger unfurling its long, bony fingers. It's when the EEV crashes down onto the planet that the changes really occur. Instead of suddenly meeting three random prisoners opening the hatch and exploring the ship, we get a glimpse of the world in which the film is set. It's dark and bleak, with metallic rigs littering the coastline. We see Clemens, the prison doctor we've barely met in the theatrical, walking alone through the dust and smoke of his home. Judging from the cinematography, his small size in the shots and the fact that he's walking alone suggests to the audience that Clemens is a loner and most likely doesn't get along well with the others. In the assembly, Clemens discovers Ripley, who, in this cut, floats to the shore while the EEV slowly sinks into the depths. Already, the assembly cut is on a superior job of conveying the film's soul-crushing, depressing atmosphere. Racing back to the prison whilst carrying an unconscious Ripley in his arms, Clemens instructs the prisoners to save the EEV while he tends to Ripley. Using a team of oxen, the prisoners pull the EEV back to the prison. In a slightly more tasteful version than the theatrical, we see Ward and Andrews type the report with differing shots of the dead crew, rather than the overlay from the theatrical. The assembly then moves on to the meeting between the warden and the prisoners. The notable inclusion being that we see the prisoners pray held by Dylan before the commencement of the meeting. Let the circle be unbroken until the day. Rather than just being told that the prisoners are converted apocalyptic Christians like in the theatrical, here we're shown through the prayer led by Dylan. We also get a sense of the power hierarchy within the prison, as Dylan clearly is the surrogate leader slash priest of the prisoners that holds the respect of both the prisoners and the warden. After the prayer, the scene plays out identically to the theatrical. Speaking of the theatrical, let's return to that version. After the meeting, the theatrical introduces us to Clemens, who treats the wounded Ripley. Ripley awakens and is informed by Clemens that the rest of her crew died in the crash. Without delay, Ripley demands that she investigates the EEV. Clemens obliges her and takes her to the ship. Once inside the EEV, Clemens tells Ripley that Bishop was smashed to pieces and chucked in the trash heap. Hicks was impaled by a beam in his sleep while Newt drowned. However, Ripley demands to see her body once she spots an acid breach in Newt's pod, a clear sign of a xenomorph. Meanwhile, Spike is unwell after encountering the facehugger, implying that he has been impregnated. What kind of animal would do this to a dog? At the morgue, we're faced with one of the most harrowing scenes in the film. Wanting to know whether Newt has been impregnated by a facehugger, she demands that Clemens perform an autopsy on Newt's body. Although unwilling to share with Clemens why Newt's body has to be examined, Clemens eventually agrees. This scene is obviously challenging to sit through. The film thankfully shows very little of the autopsy, instead relying on sound effects and facial reactions to imply the dread of the scene. I'm pretty used to gore in films, so the film has to be commended for making a jaded horror fan like myself so squeamish during this scene. Though most of the credit for this scene should go to James Cameron and Carrie Henn. Without their work in Aliens, this scene would not have been so controversial and effective. This scene was initially far more graphic, as test audiences were shown close-ups of Newt's dead body throughout the entire autopsy, guts and all. The test audiences were unsurprisingly disgusted. Some even walked out of the theatre. There was an autopsy scene on the girl that I... I like certain gore in films. I do it, and it made me sick. It really grossed me out, and I remember that people got up and left, walked out of the theatre at the time, and I was just thinking, this will never be in the film. They can't show this stuff, it was just too much. Clemens' autopsy on Newt confirms his theory, she drowned. More importantly, no chestburster is found in the girl's chest. Before Clemens can ask further questions of Ripley as to why he had to do this, Warden Andrews and prison guard Aaron enter the morgue. When Ripley insists that Newton Hicks's body be cremated, much to Andrews' frustration, Clemens sides with Ripley, convincing Andrews to cremate the bodies due to the potential disease risk. I don't want ripples in the water. And I don't want a woman walking around giving them ideas. Newt and Hicks's cremation is held in the prison's furnace. Before the two of them are sent into the furnace, Warden Andrews reads a passage from the Bible. This scene includes some big swings and a miss cinematography that, unfortunately, damage the scene's poignancy. 
The most egregious is this weird three close-up crossfades of Randrews, Ripley and Clemens while the camera trucks across a shot of random prisoners. This shot doesn't work for one main reason. This scene is all about Ripley and her suffering. This shot would imply that these three characters are all suffering from the same loss, yet only one of the three truly is. After Andrews finishes his unceremonious speech, Prisoner Dylan enters, providing a more contemplative address that provides Ripley with some comfort. She won't ever know the hardship and grief for those of us left behind. If it's not been made clear by now, Alien 3 is heavily intertwined with religious overtones, replacing the psychosexual imagery and themes of the previous two films with incendiary symbolism and themes of apocalyptic Christianity. And in concept, it's an excellent fit for the Alien franchise. The Alien series has always dealt with existential tones and themes, so turning the xenomorph into an expression of divine will and judgement is very interesting, especially in a film with such heavy-handed, bleak and depressing tones. How can anyone find hope or triumph in a universe where the closest thing to divine will is a monstrosity? The film reinforces this false sense of hope during Dylan's hopeful speech, juxtaposing his hopeful eulogy with the cruel birth of the xenomorph. Unfortunately, while it's interesting conceptually, Alien 3 does not develop these ideas far enough for the film to work, unsurprisingly due to its horrific production and butchered editing. With the funeral over and Ripley shaving her head, Let's switch the assembly cut. Some fundamental changes occur from this point in the assembly cut. The facehugger's host is changed entirely from a Rottweiler to an ox. The oxen's death surprises the inmates, as they point out that she was in her prime. Hey, Brett! What's this? The switch of the ox from the dog is interesting and helps maintain the symbolic Christian imagery that Fincher was going for. The ox is a significant symbol in biblical texts and art. The animal is attributed to Saint Luke, one of the four evangelists or authors of the original Christian Gospels. The ox is seen to be a symbol of redemption and life through sacrifice, echoing the themes of the film. Witnessing a xenomorph being born from a religious symbol of redemption and sacrifice is fantastically twisted and does a far better job narratively juxtaposing Dylan's eulogy of hope during the funeral of the birth of the xenomorph. Both versions are extreme and excessive, but one makes far more sense thematically. The only real issue is that the xenomorph doesn't change physical appearance from the dog to the ox. Both versions have the exact same xenomorph, which is disappointing when you would think that a xenomorph dog and a xenomorph ox would look entirely different from one another. But again, this is just one of the many issues that stems from the film's terrible production. With the birth of the xenomorph, we're now caught up with a theatrical. Ripley enters the cafeteria and receives an icy response from the prisoners due to their sacred pledge of celibacy. This scene finally allows Sigourney Weaver to bring back Ripley's attitude. I'm a murderer and rapist of women. Well, I guess that must make you nervous. As Ripley is in a terrible, traumatic state for most of the film, it's great to get glimpses of that hard-ass attitude. Ripley then spends a quiet moment with Clemens, talking about the prison and how the inmates developed their religious devoutness. When Clemens tries to pry into Ripley's history, she dodges the question by offering him sex, which Clemens eventually accepts. Very direct. I've been out here a long time. I enjoy Clemens and Ripley's dynamic. Weaver and Dance have good chemistry together. However, many of their interactions devolve into one or the other trying to get information from the other. That's all they talk about. And yes, I'm aware that I just described how most films use their dialogue, but here it just seems less organic and tedious. I can see the puppets being puppeteered, if that makes sense. After Ripley and Clemens' discussion, we're treated to the film's first xenomorph kill. While cleaning near an industrial fan, Prisoner Murphy, the dog owner, steps on the shredded skin of the xenomorph. Hearing a noise in a nearby vent, Murphy investigates, believing it to be his dog, Spike. Murphy is then attacked by the xenomorph and falls into the fan, his guts flying everywhere in a brief but nevertheless gory shot. Meanwhile, after waking up from intercourse, Ripley notices that Clement has a barcode tattooed on the back of his head, a sign that he is also a prisoner. We're then treated to another scene between Ripley and Clemens discussing their secrets. You have a barcode on the back of your head. 
Before he can explain, Andrews calls Clemens down to the fan to investigate the dead prisoner. The reveal of a deceased prisoner reawakens Ripley's fear of a xenomorph being in the prison. At the death site, Clemens discovers an acid burn on one of the metal grates. The same burn that he saw caused Ripley to panic. During this realization, Andrews demands that Clemens meets him in his office in 30 minutes. With the film's first kill, let's return to the assembly car and see how this edit treats its characters. Before Ripley enters the cafeteria in the assembly, we're treated to a scene where we meet more inmates in the prison. So far, I haven't been talking about the extended cast of the film, that being the inmates, because there honestly was just not much to talk about. Besides Dylan and Clemens, the rest of the prisoners have been given nothing to work with to make them stand out. It doesn't help that all the inmates have shaved heads due to a lice problem, making it hard to identify one Agent 47 from another. However, this issue has been somewhat addressed in the assembly, and this scene is an excellent example of that. Dylan settles a dispute between three of the inmates. Two of the inmates, Boggs and Reigns, argue that they don't want to work with one particular inmate, Golic, as they state that he smells bad and, more importantly, that he's crazy. Dylan refuses to grant their request, believing that Golic is one of his sheep in this flock and they must all work together. This achieves two things. It gives us further insight into the inner workings and politics of this prison, and it also gives the prisoners some character. Upon Ripley's entrance into the cafeteria, the scene plays out similarly to the theatrical with a few additions. Ripley questions what Dylan is waiting for, further reinforcing the theme of redemption. What are you waiting for? <laughs> are we waiting for God to return and raise his servants to redemption? Fincher may also be supporting the false sense of hope through Golic's sign of the cross movement now that we know he's insane. A shot that was in the theatrical, but now has added context thanks to the assembly. The following scenes are relatively identical to the theatrical. Clemens and Ripley have sex, Murphy is killed by the xenomorph, and Ripley and Clemens refuse to share information with the other. Clemens is called down to the air shaft and is now ordered to meet Andrews in his office. Now that we've caught up, let's switch back to the theatrical. Concerned that a xenomorph may have crashed with her in the EEV, Ripley sneaks out of confinement and retrieves the black box. She is caught by Clemens. I've been mentioning Clemens throughout this section, but I have yet to really talk about him. I really enjoy his character. Darth does a great job conveying this damaged yet kind man who wants to help Ripley. He's also not an idiot. He's connected the dots and knows that what Ripley is scared about is real. I want to help, but I need to know what's going on. While Ripley has the black box, she can't access the information of our computer with audio capabilities. We don't have anything like that here. Well, what about Bishop? Bishop? The droid that crashed with me. I can point you in the right direction. Clemens cannot join Ripley in her search, as he has a prior engagement with a pissed off warden. Listen to me, you piece of shit. You screw with me one more time, I'll cut you in half. This is quite a fun scene. I really enjoy Clemens and Andrew's dynamic here, resulting in a great line from Clemens. I think it might be better if I left. I find you unpleasant to be around. Andrews is frustrated by Waylon Yutani's interest in Ripley. He has received a high level communication from the company stating that she must be looked after until they arrive. Being Waylon Yutani, they refuse to elaborate on their intentions for her or why she is of high importance. When Clemens refuses to help Andrews, Andrews threatens to reveal Clemens' history to Ripley. Meanwhile, Ripley enters the trash heap in search of Bishop. Finding his damaged remains, she attempts to leave the trash dump, only to be stopped by four prisoners. We're then treated to one of the weirdest scenes in the entire film. Blocking her way, the four prisoners attempt to rape Ripley. The subject matter is incredibly dark and an incredibly sensitive issue. The Alien franchise has never shied away from implications of rape and the assault on the body. However, this scene is so strange in how conflicting the tones are. We get this very dark, brutal moment, and yet the film's score decides to put a rock beat under the scene, and the main rapist decides to put his goggles on and scream at the sky. It comes off as borderline comedy. Thankfully, the men are interrupted by Dylan, who attacks the men of a lead pipe. The film's extremity works at this moment, as we see Dylan just go to town on these attempted rapists. It's disappointing that this scene uses Ripley in such a terrible way, only for it to show Dylan's conviction in his faith and nothing else. 
it also begs the question, am I meant to care about these prisoners? Because if so, the film is not succeeding. Unlike the previous films, the supporting cast are terrible human beings. In Alien, the cast were truckers, everyday men and women caught in a horrific situation. In Aliens, sure the Marines were arrogant and underprepared, but they were still likeable and had good chemistry that made it fun to watch them on screen. In Alien 3, it's inherently complicated to make them likeable due to their status. Anyway, with Ripley saved, the film cuts to three prisoners surveying the underground section of the prison. This scene reinforces another aspect of Alien 3's failings. It just isn't very scary. The men notice that the candles along the floor that light their way are blowing in weird directions. Heading further to investigate, one of the men is separated from the other two and is attacked by the Xenomorph. It's essentially a pale retread of Brett's death in the original. While Brett's death scene was slow and patient, building the tension, it's wholly rushed and nonsensical here. For instance, in the original, we see the Xenomorph before Brett does, giving the audience more information than Brett. That's terrifying. We can only watch as Brett falls into the Xenomorph's trap. Here, the Xenomorph appears out of nowhere and immediately attacks him. It doesn't even look like it's hiding. It looks like it was right in his eye line the whole time, and he just didn't see it. The attack spooks the other two, and they run for safety. Before they can escape, one of them is killed while the other manages to flee. We then cut back to Ripley, who manages to reactivate the severely damaged Bishop. Plugging him into the black box, Bishop confirms that there was a Xenomorph on board the EEV. Believing they could make a more convincing destroyed Bishop through animatronics than makeup, the final effect was entirely used by animatronics, with a playback of Lance Henriksen's voice to help wave over her performance. The result is rather convincing. His damaged look suits the bleak and depressing world. After confirming Ripley of the Xenomorph's presence, Bishop pleased the Ripley to disconnect him, saying he'd rather be dead than live in this damaged state. Ripley grants Bishop's request. Before she can warn him, the surviving prisoner from the Xenomorph attack is brought into the medbay. The prisoner claims that he was attacked by a dragon and pleads that it wasn't him who killed the other prisoners. While Andrews believes that the man is crazy and he did kill the others, Dylan defends the man before Ripley enters the conversation, confirming that the crazy man is right. This results in Andrews demanding a meeting with Ripley. In Andrews' office, Ripley tells him everything. Much to everyone's shock, Andrews doesn't believe Ripley. When Ripley asks what weapons are in the prison, Andrews states that there are no weapons, with the prisoners kept in line through fear. The idea of having no guns in the film was at the request of Weaver, as she is very anti-gun and refused to sign off on the film with the characters used guns. The thing that scares me about the guns is that after you've been using them a couple of days, you go, oh, well, you know, this is, you know, it, you sort of get into it. And I think that's what happens to people with real guns. And I think, I think Jim Cameron is very anti-gun too, in his own way, but he, I think he's fascinated by them in a way that I'm not. I don't like that feeling you get after you've shot off a few rounds of, I'm immortal, you know, it's just garbage. I don't mind this conceit, it returns the franchise to its roots and forces the writers to be creative, even if it doesn't make much sense. While the prisoners are having a meeting held by Andrews in the cafeteria, Clemens and Ripley stay in the med bay with the crazy man. Once more, Ripley refuses to tell Clemens about the Xenomorph, which at this point just seems crazy. Clemens has been incredibly trustworthy of Ripley, what would make her think that he would suddenly dismiss her when she talks about a Xenomorph? Anyway. It's here where Clemens finally reveals his story. He was a doctor with a bright future but a crippling morphine addiction. After a 36 hour shift, Clemens got drunk but was immediately brought back into work due to a significant accident. Due to his drunken state, he prescribed the wrong dosage of painkillers, killing 11 of the 30 survivors. When I got seven years in prison and my license reduced to a 3C. When his sentence was up and Rylan Utani left the colony, he decided to stay at the prison with the others as its medical officer, knowing that nowhere else would hire him. It's a tragic tale. With the two bonded as tight as ever, let's switch back over to the assembly cut. Ripley removing the black box from the EEV plays out identically. The significant inclusion begins after this scene, as Boggs, Reigns and Golic prepare for their survey mission. These men are the same men who end up being attacked by the Xenomorph. Keen observers will have noticed that I didn't say their names during the theatrical version. And that's because we don't learn their names in that version. Including these small scenes of interactions between the inmates gives these characters distinctive traits. 
rather than just a blank slice layout in the theatrical. It's not Shakespeare, but providing some context and character interaction is better than nothing. While Boggs, Reigns and Gollick survey the underground area, Clemens and Andrew's confrontation is extended. We see more of the prison politics at play. The extension of the scene plays out rather amicably, with Andrews offering Clemens coffee. But only when Andrews orders Aaron's to leave does Andrews truly voice his dislike for Clemens. It's a slight inclusion, but suggests that the animosity between the two is behind closed doors to not reveal to the inmates that the two senior officials in the prison hate each other. In the following scene, Ripley recovers Bishop and encounters the four men precisely the same way as the theatrical. So my thoughts of this scene remain the same. After the attack on Ripley, the attack on the three men plays out precisely the same, with Boggs and Reigns killed by the Xenomorph and Gollick escaping. While Ripley talks to Bishop, the assembly decuts this scene with the discovery of Gollick eating cereal in the cafeteria while still covered in blood. It's one of the few moments of genuine creepiness in the film. We then see Gollick being restrained by Clemens, Aaron, Andrews and Dylan, leading to Gollick being taken to the med bay after Bishop's disconnection, just as it did in the theatrical. These additional scenes of Gollick serve multiple purposes. It gives context for how the rest of the prison negatively views Gollick, justifying why everyone thinks he murdered Boggs and Reigns. It's a logical step to believe he committed the murders, rather than accepting a story about a dragon. It's also the first example of Gollick showing an interest in the Xenomorph, but I'm getting ahead of myself. After Ripley meets with Andrews, she talks to Clemens, just as she did in the theatrical. The only addition is Gollick's ramblings. There's no such thing as a perfect human. In an insane world, a sane man must appear insane. That's very profound, Gollick. Thank you. Clemens then tells Ripley the story of his imprisonment, and we're now caught up to the theatrical. It's important to stress that all these additions, changes, and alterations greatly enhance the story of Alien 3. While there are still issues with the assembly, it's the closest the film can be to what Fincher was trying to achieve during production. Back to the theatrical, unfortunately, Ripley's happiness is short-lived, as the xenomorph appears out of nowhere and takes it away from her. Grabbing Clemens, it lifts him in the air and in full view of Ripley and Golic, kills him. It's sudden, violent and shocking. This scene also showcases the issue of the xenomorph in consecutive shots. As Ripley backs into the corner, the xenomorph approaches in a horrifically bad blue screen. But we're then treated to this fantastic shot of the Xenomorph's face approaching Ripley using a practical mechanical head. This is the most iconic shot of Alien 3, if not the whole franchise. It's fantastically tense. The Xenomorph's drool mixed with Clemens' blood as it slowly approaches Ripley. It's brilliant. Why the Xenomorph doesn't kill Ripley instantly is a question that will be answered later in the film. For now, the Xenomorph retreats back up to the vent with Clemens' body. Horrified, Ripley runs to the cafeteria where a meeting is being held by Andrews. Before Ripley enters, Andrews tells the prisoners that he believes Golic, in this cut the first time his name is ever mentioned, is responsible for the murders. Ripley enters, screaming at the xenomorph got Clemens. I'm killing you! With Andrews and Clemens both dead instantly, a power vacuum is formed within the prison. Aaron attempts to take the lead, but is quickly dismissed when one of the prisoners calls him 85. Don't call me that. Dylan rejects the offer for leadership by the prisoners, instead pushing for Ripley to take charge. In a change of pace from aliens, while also hammering home how bleak this setting is, as Ripley tries to devise a plan, Aaron tells her that there is no way for any of the rooms in the facility to be closed down. There's no way to see what a xenomorph is as there is no security cameras, and, as stated before, they have no weapons. Aaron and Ripley come up with a solution to trap the beast. Using an empty toxic waste bunker with thick concrete walls and only one entryway, Ripley and the prisoners will lure the xenomorph into the bunker and trap it there. During the preparations, we're told why Aaron hates being called 85. It's his IQ. This became a sore point for the actor portraying Aaron, Ralph Brown. Reportedly, Aaron was initially written as a very intelligent character, one of the few who survived to the end of the film. During production, the character was rewritten to be intellectually challenged. Brown was unable to convince the writers to restore his character's intelligence during production. During the preparations, Dylan, Aaron and Ripley discuss the plan. In what feels like an oversight from the writers, Dylan openly questions her leadership. Hey sister, what about you? You're an officer. How about showing us a little leadership? Why should we put our ass on the line for you? Your ass is already on the line. Using highly flammable chemicals stored in the facility, the prisoners paint the chemicals around the underground section of the prison, 
the plan being to cause the fire and drive the xenomorph into the bunker. While Dylan and Ripley mop the floors with the chemicals, Ripley shows signs of exhaustion for reasons that will become apparent later. As preparations continue, one of the inmates is attacked by the xenomorph, inadvertently lighting the chemicals and causing a mass explosion. Many inmates die in the blast. As they activate the sprinklers and round up their dead, Dylan, Ripley, Aaron and Moore stand outside the bunker and revel in their defeat. Out of ideas, and with 10 hours until Whale and Yutani arrives, Ripley leaves to head to the EEV while the others round up the remaining survivors and head to the furnace. With a significant defeat, let's return to the assembly cut. While Clemens' death remains the same, the tension is built up considerably. The film elongates the Xenomorph's arrival, slowly approaching Clemens while Golic watches. Clemens is killed, Ripley runs off for help, and we see Golic's reaction to the Xenomorph's kill. At the cafeteria, as Ripley approaches, Dylan delivers a prayer with the inmates before chastising them about their behaviour. I don't want no more bullshit around here! And we got problems! We stand together! Yes, thank you, Mr. Dylan. Ripley arrives, and Andrews is killed. The religious angle was once more better reinforced in the assembly, as Dylan delivers another prayer about the apocalypse before the group decides on a leader. The significant deviation from the theatrical comes during the trapping of the xenomorph. The explosion still occurs, causing hysteria and panic, but the sequence is extended, with Ripley helping and rescuing her previous assaulters. During the terror, the xenomorph is successfully flushed out, cornering Ripley and the other prisoners. Junior, the goggle rapist, sacrifices himself and leads the xenomorph into the bunker. So yes, while in the theatrical, the xenomorph isn't captured, in the assembly, it is. This is a major change. While in the theatrical, the film continually reinforces the dread and despair that the characters are in, the assembly provides small glimpses of hope and rejoicing. This also allows the film to slow down the pacing, allowing the characters to reflect and develop the themes the film's trying to explore. Dylan provides a sermon, remembering those who sacrificed their lives to capture the xenomorph. Aaron and Ripley discuss well and Yutani's plan. What if they don't want to kill it? Lunatics, you know. Gotta kill it. Right? Her distrust for the company is warranted, seeing that in the previous two films they have screwed her over multiple times and severely damaged her mental state. The assembly explores that theme heavily during this section, introducing the unknown and exploring the implications of what Dwell and Yutani capturing a xenomorph would mean. Meanwhile, Morse watches over Golic, who is still restrained in the medbay. In the theatrical, Golic is never seen or talked about after Clemens' death. He just disappears from the film entirely. How are we, as the audience, meant to feel anything for these characters when the film just forgets they exist? They wanted Golic, you know, first of all to be, to, to, to wig out, strike somebody, then he breaks out of this hospital, runs amok, goes to find the monster, who by this point is, uh, is trapped, you know, they've incarcerated this monster. Um, and he's meant to release this monster, team up with the thing, and go and kill Ripley. Fantastic. I'll take the part. Most of that stuff has disappeared, I think. Uh, you know. I've had friends say, in fact, we saw you in one scene, and then you kind of disappear. You know, you, Nobody knows quite where you disappear to, which is a bit of a mistake. In the assembly, Golic's role is made clear. Believing the Xenomorph to be a god, Golic knocks out Morse and heads to the bunker. Ripley and Aaron communicate with Rail and Yutani using Andrew's computer, requesting to terminate the Xenomorph. The company denies the request, stating it's too dangerous. This response proves Ripley to the company's intentions. Meanwhile, Golic kills the guard and opens the bunker. Reinforcing the religious reverence motif, Golic asks the Xenomorph what he should do next. In response, the Xenomorph kills Golic and runs free once more. The moment of triumph has been taken away, proving to be false. This decision by Golic showcases Finch's exploration of hope being the worst form of torment. Ripley and Dylan discuss what to do with the Xenomorph. Ripley tries to convince Dylan that they should kill it before the company arrives. At the same time, Dylan doesn't see the problem and let the company capture the beast. That world out there doesn't exist for us anymore. From here, the assembly is caught up to the theatrical. During Dylan and Morse's discussion, Ripley disappears without anyone noticing. Back to the theatrical, Ripley enters the EEV and, 
with the help of Aaron, runs a bioscan on herself. Although she believes to be suffering from hemorrhaging, the reality is much worse. At the film's beginning, we saw a crew member infected by a facehugger. Well, not only was the person infected Ripley, Ripley is carrying the next queen. It's never explained how Ripley survives this long of a xenomorph inside her, especially considering the time shown previously. However, assuming that the queen must take longer to grow in the body is logical. Knowing that the queen is inside her, Ripley tries to communicate to the company through Andrew's computer that the whole place has gone toxic. Aaron refuses to let her send the message. Look, I'm sorry you've got this thing inside you, but I'm getting rescued. But I've got a wife, I've got a kid, I'll go home on the next rotation. Ripley reluctantly gives up and decides to hunt down the Xenomorph. I like Sigourney Weaver, and her performance as Ripley is iconic. However, this shot is so melodramatic and weirdly performed that I just can't help but laugh at it. It's just down there. In the basement. This whole place is a basement. <laughs> Heading into the underground section, Ripley hunts down the Xenomorph. This scene is one of the first indications that Ripley is losing her mind. Mistaking a pipe for the Xenomorph, she is jumped by the real thing moments later. After a dramatic cut to black, Ripley confides in Dylan. The beast refuses to kill her. Supposing you want to stretch the biblical metaphor further, you can make the case that the Xenomorph views Ripley as their mother Mary, the saviour's mother. With this knowledge, Ripley tries to convince Dylan to kill her. He refuses, offering to kill her after she helps kill the creature first. He only provides this choice after really milking the drama. At the furnace, Dylan and Ripley attempt to rally the remainder of the prisoners to kill the Xenomorph once and for all. Aaron tries to appeal to the prisoners to wait for Well and Nittani to rescue them. Ripley and Dylan convince the prisoners in a rousing speech to use themselves as bait to lure the creature into the lead mold, burning it alive. Let's switch back to the assembly as we reach the theatrical finale. There are no significant changes to discuss, so we can catch up quickly. Ripley's confrontation with Aaron is extended with additional lines of dialogue, as is the scene between Dylan and Ripley, including an added line at the end where Dylan tells Ripley to kill herself if she won't help. Go kill yourself. Ooh, you're hard, showing off. The debate between the prisoners, Ripley and Aaron is extended, but the outcome is identical. Now that we're caught up, let's head into the theatrical's final act. It's messy. To recap, the plan aims to lure the Xenomorph through the tunnels using the prisoners as bait, forcing the beast into the mold where Dylan and Ripley can pour molten lead onto the trapped beast. There are many issues with this sequence, not in terms of the plot point, but in how it's presented. Firstly, the film makes a minimal attempt to provide context regarding where anybody is during the scene. The best we get is people shouting, Section A closed or East Wing locked, but every corridor looks precisely the same making it hard to distinguish where anybody is or how successful the plan is going. Once more, the idea of everyone having shaved heads backfires. As of all these fast cuts and dimly lit environments, it makes it hard to see who is who. The sequence also gives us our first look at Xenomorph Vision, which is great the first few times, especially when the cameraman switches the angles to imply that Xenomorph is running on the walls or on the roof. The issue is that the film overly relies on this shot, it happens so often that you lose this sense of meaning or tension. It just drags on for so long. This whole sequence just gives me headaches whenever I watch it. And now, we have reached one of the biggest problems of Alien 3, and this sequence is plagued by this problem the most. The visual effects for the Xenomorph looks terrible. Whenever the film uses a practical suit or mechanical head for the creature, it looks incredible, just as good as the previous two films. However, as the beast was birthed by a dog or ox, depending on the version, this xenomorph has animalistic characteristics different from the ones we've seen previously, which have been more upright and humanoid. This gave the visual effects team a problem of making the xenomorph convincing and running on all fours. Their solution was to use a rod puppet filmed against a blue screen that they could then composite into the live action footage. The puppet itself was manipulated by four to six people who were pushed to make the movements of the Xenomorph as quick as possible to make the creature feel believable. And I'm sorry to say that they've failed. It just looks so fake that it's laughable. 
It's a shame because a xenomorph birth from a different animal was a fantastic idea that allows creators to explore what they could do with the creature. Back to the film, the plan works, but with severe costs. The xenomorph kills all the expendable prisoners, with only Ripley, Dylan and Morse left. While Ripley and the prisoners have been battling the beast, Wyland Yutani has arrived, met by an eager Aaron. Back in the furnace, with Morse heading to the lead controls, Dylan and Ripley remain trapped in the mold of the creature. For the xenomorph to stay in the mold, Dylan sacrifices himself, buying enough time for Ripley to escape and for Morse to drop the molten lead onto the beast. Just like the previous films, this victory is short-lived. Spotting the overhead fire sprinklers, Ripley manages to activate them, causing the creature's exoskeleton to explode from thermal shock. The creature is finally defeated, and Ripley is given no time to celebrate as Aaron and Raylan Dutani surround her. The mysterious leader, who is revealed to look identical to the Bishop Android, reveals himself to Ripley. I'm not the Bishop Android. I designed it. I'm very human. The man makes several promises to Ripley that the company doesn't want to keep the queen inside her, that they can use a medbay in their ship to save her and that once they get it out of her, they'll destroy it. Ripley doesn't buy the pitch and gets back into the molding machine. While the man implores Ripley to reconsider, she and Morse move the device over the furnace. Believing the man to be an android, and because he has an 85 IQ, Aaron attacks the man. <laughs> The attack reveals that the man is indeed human, as we see red blood pouring out of his ear. Unlike android blood, which seems to be more of a milky white substance. As the man pleads Ripley to reconsider, she makes the ultimate sacrifice. As she falls into the fire, the queen bursts out of her chest, which Ripley clutches and pins to her chest as they perish. The ending was incredibly debated and rushed in post-production and it shows in the final film. One thing that bothered me is I still don't like the, the optical effect of her falling in there. Yeah, the fire. The, the fire, is, it, to me, just didn't work when she does her backflip, you know. My feeling for that was, it was yeah. a rush to finish. And, yeah. I, and I felt we, it was, they were shortchanging themselves. I don't, I don't think the final visual of that was, was anywhere ready. near what it could have been. It's poorly composited, and similar to the xenomorph in the film, it just looks fake. With Morse the only survivor, the film ends with a callback to the original alien. This is Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo. Signing off. The assembly cut's final act still suffers from the same issues of the theatrical. The entrapment scene is confusing, the xenomorph looks terrible, and it goes on for too long. However, small changes and additions result in a better finale overall. We see a few inmates interacting before the Xenomorph chase, asking each other whether they believe in God. As the plan breaks down, there is an acknowledgement of how confusing the layout of this section of the prison is. So what are we doing? Improvising! You're improvising. Great. The finale then plays out near identical to the theatrical. The prisoners are killed, Ripley, Morse and Dylan manage to trap the beast, Dylan sacrifices himself, Ripley kills the xenomorph with the fire sprinklers and is confronted by the human bishop. Like the theatrical, Ripley doesn't believe in bishop and approaches the furnace. After Aaron's attack, the assembly confirms that bishop is human as we see him suffering from the wound and even shouting at Ripley, I'm not a droid! Before Ripley jumps, the assembly chooses to show Ripley contemplating her decision, before ultimately deciding to sacrifice herself. A fundamental change occurs here, as unlike the theatrical, the queen does not burst out of Ripley's chest, and this ending I prefer. In the theatrical, the birth of the queen proves that there was no way Ripley would have made it to the ship in time for the operation to remove it to take place. There's no ambiguity, Ripley was screwed either way. At least in this ending, there is that sense of ambiguity. Could she have made it? Should she have made a different decision? It gives her a sacrifice more weight. The assembly ends just as the theatrical, with Morse being the only survivor and Ripley's message from the original Alien reminding us of a better film. Alien 3 sits in a strange position today. While many fans and critics are mixed with the film, it's been given more sympathy once more details arose about the troubled production and absolute mess Fincher inherited. The release of the assembly cut has also softened the blow of the film's shortcomings, with many, including myself, considering it to be the best version of this film we will ever see. 
Fincher's talent as a filmmaker is clear to see in Alien 3. With so many cooks in the kitchen, no one was sure what Alien 3 was supposed to be. Fincher tried his best to make a nuanced and intelligent film about a damaged heroine searching for meaning when losing all hope. If the movie is great, I'm going to get too much credit, and if the movie sucks, I'm going to get too much blame. My first movie, it's fairly well known, um, was a disaster. I stupidly felt that the people who were financing it had more to lose than I did if it was bad. I sort of allowed myself to be steered into this communal making, and then when the shit hits the fan, all of a sudden, Everybody scatters and you're, you're the guy standing there going, wait, who's got a suggestion now? So if I'm going to take the blame, if I'm going to take the brunt of it, I'm going to make the decisions. While it may have damaged Fincher's career in the short term, Fincher has since been recognised as one of cinema's greatest directors. His following films such as Seven, Fight Club, Zodiac and The Social Network are all brilliant, just to name a few. It'd be doubtful for Fincher to return to the franchise for any future film, which is a shame. If this film proves anything, it's that if you allowed Fincher to make the film he wanted to make from the beginning, Fincher could make one of the greatest films in the franchise. As for the franchise itself, Alien 3 did well enough at the box office, earning a worldwide gross of $175 million off a $50-$60 million budget. This allowed the franchise to live on in future sequels and prequels, but those are stories for another video.